Hey, welcome to Steve McGrath's Basecraft. Yeah, so this is it, my podcast. I've wanted to do this for years and during lockdown, I had no gigs on the horizon. I just said, you know, this is the perfect time to do this. If I don't do this now, I'll never do it. And now that being said, I really couldn't have got it off the ground without the help of two people. So I got to thank these lads, um, Colin Bulger of The Bulger Design. We've been friends for years. We've played music together. We've got in trouble together. And uh, he's a genius when it comes to any kind of design stuff. Me and myself, I could barely draw a stick figure playing the bass. So I gave him the basic concept. It's Cthulhu playing the bass. And he just sent back the first draft. I was like, that's it. That's exactly what I had in my mind. And I absolutely love the logo. So there will be t-shirts and cups and all that jazz. But let's get the first episode over first. And so thanks again, Colin. And secondly, I want to thank uh, Richie Duhigg of the Metal Cell podcast and the Smashing Skulls sessions. So yeah, Richie's been doing his thing for the last few years promoting Irish metal and now he's branched out to international metal bands and um, I was just inspired by his passion for his project and just how well he always presents it and does it so I rang him and he just gave me all the advice I needed to get this thing off the ground and he was so encouraging he even listened to the first few bits of audio I had done and gave me tips how to make it better so thanks a million for that Richie. I'm not going to talk about myself too much because you'll get to know me as the series goes on so I'd prefer just let's just get into it I'm going to introduce our first guest, Paul Bushnell. In my opinion, Paul is probably the most prolific Irish bass player out there. He's just played with everyone. Neil Young, Phil Collins, Miley Cyrus, Chris Carnell, Elton John. Like, that's just a few names. There's the list is, just goes on and on for ages. So, uh, yeah, we really hit it off. It was a, he, was, he was the perfect man for the first episode because he's, he's great to talk. So he made my job so easy. So he started off in Dublin talking about his early years, picking up the bass, and of course his big break, producing the music for the commitments. And from there we just went all over the place, talking about his career in America and his philosophy to bass playing and just life in general. And uh, yeah, it was a real organic conversation and I was delighted with it. So I um, hope you really enjoy it. Don't forget to follow me at Steve McGraw Bass on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. And of course, subscribe to whatever app you're listening to this on. Yeah, I'll see you in a minute. How are you, man? Oh, grand. It's nice and cool here. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's as cool not, over there. <laughs> not here. And uh, uh, we are, we're looking at, I think, about four or five days in the hundreds here in uh, in California. And, and but my little city, which is close to the, uh, close to the coast in, in the, you know, greater Los Angeles area, normally 85 degrees you know summertime 90 degrees we're up to i think 110 in a couple of days so uh things are things are going to get sweaty uh, not good weather for going into the shade and practicing really is it uh, not <laughs> good weather for going into the shade and practicing <laughs> yeah, the, the, the neck ends up pretty interestingly shaped after that <laughs> <laughs> i only need the first five frets anyway just stay there <laughs> that's what i'm told that's what i'm told because i no one ever pays me to go up higher than that <laughs> right so um i got your i was talking to the guys on the bassist ireland page and your name came up a lot as the guy to check out the irish bass session guy to check out so i'm delighted you came on to chat with me here we are here we are just i suppose to start off like was the bass your first instrument or did you come to it to another instrument piano or guitar maybe I, I I stumbled upon the bass. Um, I started with piano when I was maybe 10 or 11 years of age and uh, sh- should have been a wonderful experience. But I had a teacher who was about 400 years older than I was. And it was so not fun. And uh, it almost got to this weird place where I would deliberately not practice <laughs> during the week just to piss her, piss her off. And she had this, she had this incredibly scary uh, whisper scream, like in, you know, in these sort of psycho movies, you know, she'd be like, you did it. <laughs> and, I, I, and for me, that was like, you know, it was wonderful and scary at the same time. I then escaped from that uh hearing my father one evening i came home from school and i'm walking upstairs to go to my room and i hear this beautiful sound coming from a uh, a room and i and i open the door and there's my dad left foot up on a footstool this beautiful looking wooden acoustic guitar this uh, classical nylon string guitar and i was like oh what's that you know and he's like, oh, I just started taking lessons. And I'm like, I want to do that. I want to do that. You know, so he uh, 
he sacrificed his lessons to and to give to me. So I ended up going to, which is funny because I just emailed him a couple of days ago, uh, uh, a guy named Bill Brady, uh, phenomenal guitar player. Um, still going, still teaching and everything. Still going. He's 70, 74 years of age now, I think he is, which I can't believe, which makes me realize I'm getting <laughs> older too. <laughs> he, uh, he was probably, I mean, he couldn't have been more than 28 or 29 when I started studying with him. And, uh, Oh, maybe, you know, well, let me see. 20, no, he was older than that. He was probably in his mid thirties, late mid thirties. And I thought he was the coolest dude ever and started learning guitar. Uh, joined a folk group, like a, you know, a church folk group in, in my, in my school. And then one week the bass player didn't show up. Uh, he was sick. And one of the guys hands me a bass guitar and is like, y you could probably do this. So do this, you know? And my dad played bass. My dad played bass. My grandfather played bass. So God, you really be... have a musical background, like in the family. Like. Yeah, it was in the DNA a little bit, I guess, you know? And so I started playing and that was it. I was sold. That was it. I was like, this is the instrument. This is so beautiful. And look at what it does. Look at how it affects the harmony. Look at how, you know, you can completely... You you can draw you can put an entire signature on a on on a song by just changing a note or two you know it's unbelievable so so that was my introduction to the bass and uh, it stuck I guess it's a love a little bit of a love affair you know yeah we all we all have that definitely I I just straight away got hooked on the bass and really yeah yeah from a farm like farming background so wow wow and you were just like I hear this thing calling me I'm gonna go for it yeah and funnily. I've met loads of other farmers and they got into music the same. Like a lot of them are into jazz. I don't know what the connection is between farmers and jazz. That that is that is incredible. Oh my god. That's incredible. I'm gonna be I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna try and find out what that <laughs> what that what that connection is. You know what I mean? I, I can imagine, you know, far, farmer, you know, it's days, probably days spent, a degree of solitude. You're out there doing the thing yourself, probably, you know probably just singing away, singing away and music becomes this kind of, you know, this kind of the soundtrack to your life, you know? It must be, I don't know, but I, there's one farm up the road now and he's, uh, he's a colorful character, like, and uh, he was, tell <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me he was playing a bit of music and then I don't know how someone just gives you a weather report CD. It's not like, I don't know, a pop record or something. You just go, Hey, check this out. But he put it in his tractor and it was like a Eureka <laughs> moment. He put it in and he said he stopped his tractor in the middle of the field, he was plowing or something, and he ran no. up and down the field, <laughs> no. screaming. He was like, "What? Uh, this okay. music?" I have, I have a great, a really similar story for you. I was about to leave Ireland. Um, I had finished the the commitments movie and the, all the work that had to go with that. I was leaving the country, and I wasn't sure whether I was coming back. And so, I uh, I had a young nephew uh, or a cousin. Excuse me, my cousin Brian. Kavna is his name. How are you, Brian? Um, <laughs> uh, and Brian, um, my, my uncle and his family had moved from Dublin out into uh, Stamullen, just north of Dublin, little town, 30 miles north of D Dublin. And they integrated themselves into the set. They wanted a little bit of country life. They wanted to get out of it. And Brian, I saw him maybe six months later or nine months later, and he's 10 years of age or 11 years of age. And he's, he's getting a little bit of a, you know, a North County Dublin, uh, you know, sort of accent or he's like, you know, you could hear he's changed, he's changed, 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 and he's talking about tractors and he's talking about farms and animals and everything like that. The next time I see him, the first thing he says to me is Paul, do you know Bootsy Collins? <laughs> <laughs> Some uh, discovery. <laughs> I was like, what? What? You know? So I immediately, I, I because I literally was about to leave. Yeah. I, I went downtown bought him a bass guitar, an amp, a speaker, a tuner, some strings. And I said, look, go have fun. And he sent me music through the years. He, he had like a, a fun, you know, like a, a fun cover band and stuff like that. And they would, they were brilliant. They were so good. And he's a badass bass player, like badass, you know? And so it's, you know, he went from, he literally went from the farmyard and the tractor to actually playing for fun, you know? And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's a, yeah, it's definitely a, so that's an exclusive, thing. all the best play bass players start as farmers, you know? <laughs> there it is. There it is. But you heard it here. 
<laughs> or, or you can translate to farming like John Coltrane and decided to start doing a bit of farming later in life. You know? there, you, there you go. There you go. I think it's uh, it's I think it's the more maybe it's something to do with the more organic your relationship is with the instrument. Like if you uh, remove a lot of the maybe sometimes remove a lot of the 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 if not the accessories, but you have to, I think you have to abandon yourself to the love of it and, and, and let it love you back, you know? And, um, it, I think, I think being in touch with the land is very much, a, is a very similar thing. You know, you have to, you have to read nature, you have to understand, you know? And making a living as a farmer is a vocation and same with a musician. You're not going to, you're never going to, you're not going to be rich. <laughs> No doubt. No doubt. It's uh, if if it ever was if people ever thought it was hard, you know, like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it has the landscape has so dramatically changed, you know, and uh, that's a whole other. But I'm curious. Not about, very good. Story. No, it's tough going out there, but I'm definitely curious about what you were, how you got onto your music when you were young, because we all have like Spotify. And we, when I was growing up, I had CDs. But like, how did you oh, access I, your music and what were you listening to? When at home, you see, this is the as we as we touched on earlier. My parents were both musical. My dad played bass. He played drums. My mother was, you know, was a phenomenal singer and and an entertainer. And so when I was growing up, all I heard in my house was American soul music, R and B. You know, it was Stevie Wonder. It was Aretha Franklin. It was Otis Red. It was like all of that music was just on in my house all the time reel to reel tape like this was like you know old school <laughs> old school shit you know cuz tape sounded better you know so uh and and uh i'd be in there all the time just like you know spooling up the reel and listening to this stuff and just vibing and um i guess i remember i remember going to uh i grew up in 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 Rathfarnham like Temple Ogary in Dublin and lived in the same house my entire childhood, you know? So you, you, I remember going down every Saturday to, uh, the local record store down at, um, uh, Ref Farnham shopping center. There was a record store upstairs and I'd spend the whole afternoon just like looking through, looking through the, yeah. the, the, the albums, you know, looking through and taking them out and you could open them and reading. And this was, you know, unfortunately these things are gone. You have to, you have to search deep now sometimes to get or just go constantly back to all music or something like that to be yeah, like, you who, do. Played, who played on this? You know, who did the artwork? I mean, you know, when, when you see an album, when you see an album that has incredible artwork, that's inspiration straight away. And you're curious and you want to get in. I think, um, you know, the sort of digitized nature of everything now and the the anonymity and the fact that, uh, you know, everybody's scrambling for their peace and, and, um, you know, musicians are not even getting credited sometimes now on, 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 you know, I'll tell you something for nothing, you know, I mean, there's, there was a sort of a well set up union situation here for musicians and it still exists pretty aggressively for, uh, for, um, orchestral musicians, people who are playing on, on movie soundtracks that's still, you know, though they are also being outsourced, you know, to other countries it's like, uh, you know, Eastern European countries are doing a lot of the orchestral sessions instead of uh, in the States now, you know, cause it's just become too expensive, I guess, even though, you know, movies are raking in billions of dollars and stuff like that. But it's, um, um, but for the rock musician, you know, which, uh, you know, I, I would sort of categorize myself in, um, you've got no protection. There's no protection anymore, which is really sucks. Cause you are definitely, you're on your own. And not only are you on your own, but in a country where you pay $2,000 a month for health insurance, yeah, you know, it's crazy. You know? Um, there's no fallback like you, you, there's no fallback you're on no your own. safety net like yeah you're on your own and so it's you kind of grow up pretty quick here you know if you if you uh if you want to have a certain a certain uh you know if you want to try and achieve like most people i think want to achieve as they go through their lives a degree of comfort it's going mm. to cost you an arm and a leg over here yeah. and you got to work your you got to work your ass off you know and you don't want to get sick because you've got you haven't got that net you know you don't want to get sick. That's why I'm masking up. You know, I'm 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 full on mask. You know. Yeah. But why not wear it? Like got, it's not going to do you any harm. Yeah. Oh no, 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 no. It's it's but, um, um, it's a smart thing to do. I think definitely. But uh, I I suppose the commitment. Would you say that was your like big where you, your big break? Like in where you, that that was a that was a life changer. That was a life changer. But 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 it comes with it a good a good story about. Um, 
how you sort of behave on your journey. You know, I mean, I spent, I spent my twenties, I, I went to UCD for a minute, like, and, and, uh, study in science, physics, math, you know, early computer programming. This was like 1982, you know, 83. That's when I went, I went to college, you know, you weren't even born. Come on. No. Hey, <laughs> I wasn't. But I, I, I was kind of imagining in my head, like that your computer would be the size of this room, this shed I'm in, you know, and you're there, there tinkering away in it. It wasn't, it was actually the very, it was literally when the first, you know, the, the, the first Mac computers came out, you know, and they were, and then, you know, quickly after that, or well, not so quickly, but I guess near the end of the end of the eighties, early nineties, I think the iMac or the first iMacs came out, the colorful ones, but I was, you know, learning how to program computers. I didn't, it, it, in as much as I am a kind of a scientist, it just didn't ring my bell. After a while I was like, I'm mm. mm, not sure that I'm into this. I'm walking down Grafton street. Um, uh, there's a bunch of guys playing music on the street and they're busking and there's, and there's a huge crowd around them. And I push my way through and it's four guys I know from college uh, who are all arts block guys. And I'm like, okay, I want I'm this. Do- <laughs> I'm doing this. I ran yeah. straight in. It. I joined up. Okay. What I'm getting to is that I spent most of my, my twenties in Dublin playing in a lot of different bands, you know, and you, there was no such thing as really, you were barely scraping by, you know, you do a gig, you buy your food, you, you, you try to put a little bit aside for your rent. Um, uh, maybe go out and party a little bit. That's very important prerequisite. And, uh, (laughs) and, and, and you just kept kind of moving along like that. And it was because I didn't want to, I didn't want to become, uh, I hate to use the word and I don't use it disrespectfully, but I didn't want to become kind of establishment. If you like, I didn't want to, um, you know, that quest for, you know, like that I spoke about a minute ago for like security. And Mm. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. I wanted to, I wanted to stay, you know, young, free and single basically, and just enjoy, enjoy, right. Enjoy my life. Right. Um, I ended up uh, getting asked by, by, by someone, uh, someone who I, I, cause I used to do a tiny bit of part-time bar work. Sorry, mm. this, is a very, this is a very long lead up to something, but it's, That's it's good. I like it. it I like yeah, it. I, it's, it's, I, we it's, all it's, do part-time stuff. Yeah. I, I, I was working as a builder for the last few years on the well, side. There, there you go. You know, you got, you got to do what you got to do. I used to, I used to talk a lot with this person used to come in, gentleman used to come in, sit at the bar, um, definitely had a, an issue, but was a very well-behaved alcoholic, very well-behaved. Um, I would always make sure or try to make sure that he got home safely, get him a cab or make sure he's all good. Uh, he called me up a few days, a few years later, um, uh, got your number from someone, someone, uh, I've been, I've been, uh, following your career. And I'm like, <laughs> what is this career thing you speak of you know he's like no you're doing good you're like man people are paying attention you're, he was invested you, in you like he was your bar yeah, you know? yeah, yeah yeah exactly right you're getting a little bit you know people are are hearing you. they're hearing you. Mm. i'm like okay that's great he says i have a um i have a a, a client i'm a manager i'm a uh, i manage a couple of acts right now and uh and one of my uh, needs some help. He needs to, you know, he's got some new songs, wants to hear these songs. And I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll help him. So I got a few friends, put a thing around him and play the songs. And we, we rehearsed to do a show. We never ended up doing the show, but we spent about nine or 10 months, you know, just like once a week, maybe getting together and rehearsing these songs. Great relationship with the, with the, uh, with the, the guy himself, a guy named John Hughes ended up managing the course. And that's, that's where this will sort of come around to John calls me a couple of years later and says, Hey, you know, the, you know, this movie they're making in town. And I'm like, uh, yeah, but I'm too old, man. I'm like 27 or 28 or something like that. I'm too old. No, 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 no. Get your guys. We need to audition like hundreds of kids, you know? So get your guys come over here next Saturday, boom. And let's do it. So from, from basically looking after Barry in the bar 10 years earlier, I got my audition, if you like, for the serendipity movie. there. Like right there. And, and, and the story is, you know, I mean, I'm a, I remember seeing that, uh, you know, or a movie, I can't remember, uh, pay it forward or something like that, you know, where you, like, if you go, if you, if you try to go through your journey and just be a good person, maybe, maybe good, good things will come to you. Maybe, you know, or you could get run over by a fucking bus, but maybe good things <laughs> will come to you. Who knows? Hopefully. You know? So anyway, in answer to your question, that was a long answer. Yes. 
the commitments was a life changer. It definitely mm-hmm. was a life changer. Um, uh, I had no intention of coming to the United States. I, it, it didn't appeal to me. Um, I, I, I thought the TV shows, most of which, most of them were that I saw as a kid and everything like that, I just thought they kind of sucked. And I was like, I was much more invested and interested. I used to hitchhike around Europe and play on the streets. And I was much more interested in the history and the, the you know, the richness of culture of Europe. And I was like, nah, 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 nah. But I went over and, you know, okay, I kind of went Went over on a bit of a silver spoon and get picked up by a stretch limo outside the airport and and I get out and I'm looking up into the sky and it's like what is this glowing object what is this glowing object I see what do you mean it's out every day you know so that, that was it I was like oh my and you're God. not even 30 at this stage just exactly still- yeah I'm like I gotta I gotta find a way to I got to find a way to stay here. I got to yeah. work this out. So went through a whole process. Got, and luckily, I, I ended up getting a, a, I ended up getting one of those uh, visa lottery, you know, green card visa lottery things. And uh, McCarthy um, visa is that the one? Uh, oh yeah, it's a, yeah. I think mine was either a McCarthy. I, I can't even remember what it was called, but uh, but um, uh, that was my that was my welcome to America and uh, the greatest thing. I mean, it was. I I will absolutely. A hundred thousand percent say that had I not gotten this opportunity, I would be either drunk and disorderly in the corner of a bar uh, if I could afford it or dead. Uh, I really actually this was a lifesaver, you know, because I was kind of heading down a rabbit hole. I had between between the Fountainhead, Mary Coughlin, the Partisans, like all the the big noise, all these lots of different bands that I was playing in. Um, In the big picture for me, on a selfish level of how is this going for you, they were kind of going nowhere. There was always going to be a termination, you know? And that would leave me like, okay, I've spent 10 years playing with other people, but I've got nothing. So I can't, so this was an amazing. Make your own identity like as a bass player. Exactly, exactly. And, and, uh, but I kind of, you know, I mean, I got, I got here and, uh, and it started, the party started up again because (laughs) there was a whole other, you know, a whole other. So you're Irish guy in LA, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh God, Jesus. (laughs) Do uh, (laughs) do you remember a period like, because obviously you're I an amazing. I thought you were going to say to me, "Do you remember any of us?" <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it wouldn't be that cruel. I was going to say, like, you're an amazing bass player, but do do you do you remember like hitting the shade hard, like before you left for the LA when you were younger, like and transcribing okay. those records you're talking about? I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you uh, because I am very honest about about my my. Um, my 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 assets and my limitations shall we say i the only the only time and this is and this this is going to sound weird but i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to qualify it by saying i know my limitations i still have so much to learn as a player like there are things mm-hmm. that i can't even touch that i would that i need to shed it's almost like it's almost like i've hit a point now in my life where i'm actually going to start shedding like really shedding really because i've because i've never done it before okay so I, you can enjoy the, it like i exactly exactly and i and i think i can i can hear a lot of it better i think experience you know life and uh patience and stuff like that you know has given me the 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 facility to actually hear stuff better and it almost almost slow it down in my head and be like oh okay and and try to catch more than just the notes but why why the player chose to put it exactly there what what was he what was what was he or she feeling you know so it was more osmosis at the start like it was, it was just seeking coming in you're, you're an empty Absolutely. vessel you're Absolutely. getting those bass lines in the only thing I remember like really blistering my fingers on was a part of Dazed and Confused by Led Zeppelin from the, right, right. That was the easy bit. It was, and there was no video. So I didn't see how he did it. And I realized later that John Paul Jones, he kind of, he, he slid into stuff that I was trying to actually play. There's a middle, there's a middle, there's a piece about, you know, a couple of minutes into that where it goes, that 
that's the only thing I really ever would shed it. I tried, I was like, how is he doing that? He's going so fast. I got to try to do that, you know? And I was going, eventually my fingers were like this size, blisters up here kind of thing. And then I saw a year, you know, maybe a year or two later, I saw the the uh, the movie, The Song Remains the Same. Yeah. And I saw that he was going, so he kind of made it easier for, you know, for himself. But that, you know, I mean, that truly, that truly is the is the only the only ridiculous shedding that I've ever done. The rest was like just in the field. Gig ready, like, you know. Gig there you go. Just get in and play, get in and play. And I did, I'll tell you what, um, I did a very good apprenticeship. You know, um, I was in what they would call over here, a top 40 band, but I was in a band called Linda Martin and chips, right? Yeah, like, but way Eurovision in, fame. Exactly. Linda. Yeah. Exactly. And there was the guy, the music director and the co you know, owner of that band, Paul Little, who's a great keyboard player and guitar player and uh, uh, still playing music in Dublin, Paul is. Uh, and I said, big love to him and to Linda. Um, <laughs> well, Linda. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, I learned a lot in that short period of time working in a, co a cover band, like a pop cover band, because you were hearing all of the top players from other countries on these tracks. And that's where you would, I guess you, you could call that shedding too, right? Because I learned those parts. I listened, I learned those parts. I, you know, in my ham fisted way, I tried to dial in the sounds of what they played. This was like when, you know, level 42 was out and Mark King was yeah. going, yeah. Slapping the crazy. Slapping the, slapping the shit out, slapping the bills, you know, he was like <laughs> slapping the shit out of it. And he was, yeah. he was musical, really musical, you know? And uh, so there, there was a learning curve there as well, which, you know, brought, obviously helped bring me to another level, you know? And then the rest, you know, the, you know, many musicians have said it, but I remember John Bonham saying like, you know, try not to get less for the first six months of our year of your, and you might pick up some bad habits, but you might also develop your own, your own thing, you know? Definitely. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, honestly, I have no idea what my, you know, if I have a thing, I don't know. There, there are some people, uh, I, I've been working the last almost 20 years now here with, uh, with Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, right? And mm. I started working with Faith um, 2001. Uh, but I got that gig basically by Tim and Faith being on a train in Italy, um, uh, going from one city to another on a vacation. And Tim was listening to a Phil Collins record that I played on called Testify. And he, he said to, he told me this afterwards. I was like, you're kidding me. He, he said, he said, I heard the bass player and I was like, Faith, you need this guy in your band. I don't care. I don't know what he looks like. I don't know where we find him. I don't know if he's got one eye and his ears are on the back of front. You need, whoever this is, you need him in your band. And literally four days later, I got a phone call from her management. Uh, Can you come and play on a record? And I, li I literally went to Capitol Records, full orchestra, David Campbell. I was shitting a brick because I had never done a full orchestra date before. Do you read and, like uh, as well? Like, I'm a shite reader. Um, yeah. It's all, it's Same all, been, here. it's all been ears for me, the, the, the whole journey. And in a way that was, again, that sort of, you know, 20 something year old, uh, oh, I don't want to become part of the establishment. You know, why would I want to go in and read somebody, uh, what somebody else wrote? Why would I want to do that? You know, uh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. and then, you know, as you see, as you get older, you think of orchestral players who are phenomenal musicians mm -hmm. and they read every single moment of every day, but listen to what comes out when they do it. It's divine, you know? So I grew into the concept of, okay, you can, you can put some of yourself into what somebody else has written. You know, I, I didn't understand that at the time. Um, I, I would like to think that all the session work that I've done here is because somebody in the room wanted something that they thought that I could bring to their record. That's it. You know, yeah, um, well, that's down to your own voice. You know, they wanted 
your and sound, again, Paul's sound. Again, you know? again, whatever that is, because honestly, you know, and this is why we had this uh, earlier little chat about about equipment and stuff like mm. that. I'm I'm a luddite. I am. Yeah. I still have the same pedals. Maybe I've, I've had for years. I haven't bought a bass in ten years, twelve years. Mm. Um, have you uh, got a lot of basses you'll bring to I, a session? I, like, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, I mean, I've, I'll bring seven or eight basses to a session, but just because just because they've got a different thing to give, you know. Mm. I don't have, you know, I don't have seven vintage p bases you know yeah. i have one not so vintage p base like an 80s p base um i have you know i have a couple of music man bases i have a, a fender five string jazz straight off the shelf no extra pickups or no new pickups no nothing i just i'm not i i hate to say it but i'm i'm not if it sounds like a f- bass, I'm good. You yeah, know? It's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, <laughs> you, you don't know? have to be obsessed with gear. <laughs> it's probably, I think we need more people in the world like that. There, there are a lot. There are definitely a lot of obsessives. And, but um, and, uh, yes. <laughs> but no, I, do, I think um, what's the pro- what's hard for young bass players coming up? They're not really getting the opportunity to find their own voice through gigging. Like, because right, there, there right. just isn't gigs there. Like, you know, right. Uh, the I, sad, the, the sad thing that I found, uh, and I don't know whether it's a um. You know, I know there's still a lot of great uh, independent uh, new music being created in Ireland. And I fully understand in the same breath how difficult it is for a lot of these bands to to get an audience. You know, Um, most people most people are doing a nine to five. You know, most people do a nine to five. And at the weekend, most people who come out to see music or go to a bar because it's more like you go to a bar and there's music on the side, you know, can I have a pint and some fish and chips and a little music on the side, you know, um, most of those bands have to play to whatever that bar is of what the audience will go to the manager of the bar later. I love them. They're great. You know, or they, they fucking suck, you know, like, you know, well, what are you steely fucking dad? You know, it's like, you know, it's bollocks, you know? And so, <laughs> but I went into, I have to say on a, on a, on a previous visit, back to dublin i went into uh brussels late one night i was just wandering wandering with a buddy up through barry warner i don't know if you know barry warner barry warner was amazing amazing electronic uh he was he was one of the only irish musicians in the 80s who was right on the kind of leading edge of an electronica um kind of a, a vibe and he's uh, out of Limerick, man, and he 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 tells you what to, he'll tell you what time it is in a heartbeat. <laughs> doesn't take shit from anyone, and he is funny as the day is long, and and he's brilliant. And uh, big out to Barry too, big ups, man. Yeah, he uh, he and I were walking. We went into uh, Brussels, and there's um, uh, Jay Duffy um, uh, playing drums, and uh, um, a brilliant band. Like four guys were brilliant. Mm. That's a tiny bar as well, isn't it? Tiny bar. <laughs> and they're in the corner. And thankfully, there's a lot of people there. There's a lot of people there because they know that these guys are brilliant. But from And they're playing more sophisticated sort of songs. And that's wicked. I also went to see... Uh, I went to see... Uh, uh, with my best mate, Ronan McNamara. Went to, went on a previous visit back. Went to see... Oh, no, he couldn't come to it that night. Went to see Asia, I think they're called. Like, it's a Steely Dan cover band oh yeah, yeah i've seen them doing the circuit yet yeah. holy yeah you really were good you really have to be they good were, to be in a steely dan tribute man oh oh my god i mean i'm I, I, there was a moment where i listened i burned those albums up you know and and i really in, ingested the uh uh the the, the cordial i really ingested it they were one thousand percent spot on brilliant you know so but but uh, back to i mean oh which sorry stream of consciousness come on I'm no it's cool go, but, Irish. I, 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 but I do <laughs> I, I do think though like the decade you grow up in has a big effect on like if if i was to be in a chart oh, yeah. band right now the music i would like would be playing i don't know what it improve my bass playing as much a lot of the, the line i wouldn't get to play a lot it, of the it, classic songs it, you know it, it most likely wouldn't even be a bass guitar. You exactly. Know, to be honest. A you know? MIDI keyboard or something. You know? <laughs> you know, right? You know, it's, uh, I mean, the only bit of fun bass playing that's been out relatively recently was, you know, some of the Bruno Mars was, tracks. That's and, funny. Uh, I was about to say that when his funk song yeah. came out and the kids were all loving it. It's like, this music's been yeah. around for 40, 50 years. Come it's on. Years. Yeah. Right, right. You know, so uh, it's, there's not a lot of, 
yeah, there's not a huge amount of 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 uh, at least out in the in the you know on the radio in the front of everything. There's not a lot of inspiration there for bass players. I've heard your bass playing though on the radio. Like I heard that Michael Bublé song, and you do oh, this yeah, yeah. sweet lick in yeah. it. So <laughs> you managed to poke through the, the <laughs> noise. <laughs> you poke through the noise of radio with a bass lick, and then it, it peaked my ear. <laughs> Do you know what's funny? We uh, I, I went up to uh, Vancouver to do that. Um, Bob Rock was producing. And, oh, cool. Metallica. Uh, Bob, yeah, right. Metallica. Right. Isn't that crazy? How does that happen? You know, <laughs> I, and I'll tell you the, how that happens. They, they both of them were coming out of like the Juno Awards or something like that, uh, an award show separately. And they're standing on the sidewalk waiting for their cars to appear. And Bob turns to Michael and is like, hey, man, just want to say hi. Uh, you know, I love what you're doing. You've got this great voice and da da da. And Michael says to him, you're Bob rock aren't you he's like <laughs> yeah I didn't, I didn't think you know boom they start making records together you know uh, so uh so uh um i had worked with bob uh on a record for gavin rossdale um uh which was a, a great record wanderlust had a beautiful single on it um uh, a couple of singles and he brought me up to vancouver um we we heard the song played it i doubt we played it more than three times it was just like it just it has one of those feelings that you you get into it and it's just like there it is that's beautiful but when i heard the record i was like i didn't play that riff i didn't play that like twice i i, I think i played that riff like once and then i i met bob and he's like hey remember that lick i copied it because i loved it hey, he's, <laughs> yeah, a, ba- I he's a bass it. player you know it's nice to have a bass player <laughs> producing the record like. well that that uh that uh i mean that whole dum da da dum that was the you know that was the backbone of that was already written in the song but uh that little thing the the in the outro he, he was just like, oh. yeah 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 he's like i love that i love that so <laughs> that's if, class. If, if that's what I, if that's if that's what i bring then that's what i bring thank god that's good and hopefully my pocket was good <laughs> oh it was that's the base on that is lovely but would, would you find would you approach sessions different or would you be you, you I will say when you were younger, starting out, would you have been more apprehensive to push forward with a lick like that on a session? Or were you always confident to go? No, I actually think I was the other way around. Um, um, I was probably an over player <laughs> when I uh, when I started doing sessions here. Um, and then in 2001, as I said, I, I got uh, I got involved with Faith Hill. And then, uh, you know, squ- swiftly after that, playing on our husband on Tim McGraw's records. And in Nashville, you know, it's it's a very different situation than in L.A., um, it's very difficult to color outside the lines in Nashville. Very difficult. There's a very uh, um, kind of an old, old, it's not even old school because in a way old school was daring, you know, there, uh, it's almost like this weird thing. And, you know, with, with, uh, with, uh, yeah, it's almost like this weird thing where music started getting dumped down a little you know um and and i know like if you listen to a classic album from the 70s listen to a a, if you can you know listen to a prog record from the 70s which was considered almost pop music i mean at one point or even listen to uh, listen to bowie listen to bowie listen to bowie's songs and the bizarre wonderful crazy outside choices of chords that he makes and then listen to 99 percent of that's on uh, shit that's on the radio right now and it's one chord maybe two yeah. chords if you're lucky and three if you're very lucky you know it's been so dumbed down um i as a as a person who liked to play and to be expressive um you know you had to cur- curtail yourself a little bit but i also was smart enough to realize that there was a reason that they brought me down there. And maybe that's because I did color outside the lines a little bit. And I subsequently over time, people began to tell me that quietly on sessions. They're like, I love how you go for shit and they let you do it. You know, it's (laughs) like, okay, cool. That's good. You know, that's all right. I can do, cause I came in with a pedal board full of shit, you know, Mm. and delay I'm putting delays on bass guitar. They're looking at me like freaking out the producer. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, but then, but then they hear what it does and they're like, all right, Paul, I like that. I really, like that you know <laughs> i was like that's great man great okay yeah anytime you know let's 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 you know explore this space explore this space well, you there know? you go you can't learn that you know you, you that's just exploring the sound and your own yeah, exactly. your own exactly. voice exactly. you know 
Exactly. I mean, I think, you know, it still, it still amazes people sometimes when I speak to them um, that a lot of the stuff that, that you hear that I've played on, and I'll describe the process in the room, literally, like when you're making a record in Nashville, you will all stand around, you know, the table in the middle of the studio or the, in the control room or, you know, the bench that's there and you, everyone, there'll be eight or nine people in the room. You'll listen to the demo of the song. And the nature of Nashville is that demos are really well put together. A lot of the time, demos are almost like records, you know, and, and that's, that's good because you get a real sense of where the artist is going with the song, but it's bad because it doesn't leave you a lot of room to explore the space. You know, you're kind of tied in. Everyone's been, the record company's been listening to it for months. The artist has been listening to it for months. And then they ask a bunch of guys to come in and, you know, put your thing on. Yeah, and they don't like, want to hear a squiggle on the bass. Coming they, out. They don't want to hear, <laughs> you know, right? And so uh, you have to, you definitely have to choose your moments. And if and if you don't go for something that you play, maybe you know, b- split your signal and put a sound. You know, say, hey, open up an extra track for me, and just you can mute it if you want, but just put it in record and maybe listen to it later and see if you like what's going on with it. You know, um, because you know that and that gives them, a, oh wow, this to that. You know, if we just put that in here, it adds this little moment of, you know, so you you you. you you, you move with the you move with the moment that's like the producer in you like isn't it like well there you go there you go i mean and a lot of sessions that i do now are from right where i'm sitting here you know so i will send i will split um i will spl- i will record maybe five when i'm doing a performance i'll record five different tracks and i'll have a different amp on each track a different amp speaker combo combination and then maybe i'll have a you know a guitar amp on another track so it's just like full-on stun distortion or whatever distortion works for the for the song and then maybe a wild card you know some wild card um which might be an overdub that won't necessarily be i won't do a wild card the whole way through, but it'll be it'll be and i'll say hey i'm sending you you know five i'm sending you five tracks they're all to be played at the same time. So put them in in the same place, but just mute what you don't, what you feel doesn't sound right because I don't know how you're going to mix this. And since we're not sitting in the room working on it together, I'm going to give you, give you these options so you can, so in a way that the technology that in a way destroyed uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the energy behind our careers, you know, going to studios and working with lots of people, you know, and I, I mean, the way technology you know, took away the, the, the revenue stream and the whole session thing sort of, sort of slowed dramatically for everybody. I have a funny story about that for you, but I'll get into it at some point. At some point. Oh yeah. We've, we, <laughs> we have loads of time here. It's great. It just started raining. <laughs> yeah. It just started raining here in Ireland. So hopefully you can't hear Wait, the, the drip sorry, drops. Ra- rain. What is that thing <laughs> you speak of? <laughs> I, I have a steel roof on my shed and it gives, it's very, oh uh, it's very soothing. Like, you could fall asleep to that sound. Like some people have an app Holy on their phone. Holy shit. Well, you, you have just made me flat back to this little shed uh in my parents backyard and it had one of those corrugated tin roofs and i remember the sound of the uh of the rain hitting the uh hitting the top of the shed i'd go out there we, we had a little a little uh my dad i think had a keg out there or something like that you know <laughs> go out and get a get a get a pie <laughs> the keg was for sitting on right <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> strange enough they put the film Demolition Man on Netflix this week and I was watching Demolition Man and I Googled you while I was watching it and it says, you're on the soundtrack. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was, we see, when I came here, when I came here, as I said, I sort of flicked the party switch again real quick after, you know, and... Uh, hey, at and least I, you can I, switch it though. Thanks, <laughs> well, there you go. But thankfully, in the midst of that, I met my wife, and she's still my wife now, 27 years or 20, yeah, we met 27 years ago. But uh, uh, the party was going on, and at a certain point, I sort of woke up and I was like, holy shit, okay, uh, I have no career, and, and I had met a lot. The good thing was that on the back of the commitments, I had been able to get a lot of uh, meetings with, you know, kind of players, uh, you know, power players, if you like. Um, and I, maybe it was my sort of irreverent, you know, Dublin energy uh, or something like that. But I seem to connect with a lot of these people on a on a person on a person to person basis. They are still Randy Jackson and Don Waz and people like this, you know, who I met way back at the. Um, and so they actually weirdly because I uh, I you know co-produced the commitments with Kevin Killen 
brilliant engineer out of out of out of Dublin and then went to New York in 89, I think or 87, maybe 88 after working with you two and Elvis Costello and everything like that. Um, and, and Alan Parker, God bless him. I can't believe the, the man died there uh, a month ago. That was, it's just like insane, insane. Um, uh, very sad because he changed my totally changed my life. Um, it took a risk on me, you know. Yeah. I was the guy with the I was the guy with the audition band, you know, helping helping to audition the people yeah. uh, to get into the movie. And he he came up to me. He's like, "Hey, I like the way you work. Let's uh, let's do this again next next week." And I'm like, "You know, you make the kids feel comfortable. That's great." You know, I'm like, "Okay, good, yeah, great. I don't know what I'm doing, but great." And uh, and then the next week we did it, and the next week I'm handed a pile of cassettes, cassettes. Um, with about a hundred R and B songs on them, you know, soul songs, and 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 he said, "Yeah, we're going to go into a rehearsal space, and I want you to uh, uh, rehearse these songs up, you know, and get a band and do all this, and and uh, I'm going to come in at the end of every day and listen to twenty or twenty five songs, and um, uh, and then we'll decide what songs we want in the movie." I'm like, "Oh shit, okay," and I've never. I have no idea how to arrange horns. I have to write all the all the horn parts out. I I, I literally went to I think it was McCullough Piggott's, got the Don Sebesky you know arrangement book, and I was like, oh really? You've got to write that in that key? That's weird, you know? Like you go up a minor th- or whatever, yeah. You know? And and we did that. And at the end of that, he's like, all right, okay, so see you Monday. I'm like, what? Is <laughs> Baptism by fire. <laughs> is there a party or something? I'm like, and he's like, no, you're producing the record. I'm. Like, and the movie, what <laughs> you know? So anyway, um, um, uh, what? Yes, I had my party on after all that. Like uh, when I came over here, after all that party on, I started playing in. Um, I, I, I literally in a coffee shop met somebody who said, "Oh yeah, you should come down and maybe sit in, well, you know, for a show at a little coffee, a, you know, restaurant gig place called Genghis Cohen um, in 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 Fairfax District." And and I went down. I started doing these tiny little gigs for like twenty bucks, you know, you, you, I, I, with, with a couple of artists. And then um, a producer comes in to see one show. Uh, uh, and God, he died as well to, in the last year and a half. Uh, Ed Ed Cherney, unbelievable Ro- Rolling Stones, all the mixer, all, everything, you know, brilliant, beautiful man. Um, and Ed asked me to come play on this, on this kid's record. And that started the whole like, um, um, uh, word to mouth thing. Now from that same club, from that same club, this British producer and God help me, I forget his name. Uh, the hard drive is I'm old and the hard drive is full. <laughs> but it's early, it's early over there as well. In fairness, like, <laughs> And he's like, what are you doing later tonight? And I'm, I'm like, well, I was planning on sleeping, but what, what, you, what do you got in mind? He says, well, I have to do, uh, have to do the song Demolition Man uh, um, uh, for the movie. And uh, we, you know, they're making a new movie or whatever. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, doesn't Sting play bass on that stuff? And he's like, no, no, no he's in England. Or he, does, he can't be here. And, you know, so will you come up? And so I just grabbed a couple of pedals, grabbed my octave, the boss octave pedal, and I'm like, fuck, let's the sound go. Of, you know? Sound of the 80s, the octave pedal. The sound of the 80s. Come on, sound <laughs> of the 80s. So, th- so there I am. <laughs> that was that, you know, Demolition Man. And then I got to, I actually got to tell Sting, I, I, I did a thing um, after Bowie died, uh, a bunch, like a hundred LA and New York musicians got together to do these shows around around in in la and new york tribute to bowie because we all had friends my sterling campbell and galen dorsey and uh uh, uh jerry leonard our irish uh, musician jerry leonard who played with bowie for 12 years you know i mean uh we all had had friends who played with bowie and we were all i grew up on bowie man i i sang i sang uh life on mars at maybe 11 years of age on a single decker bus coming up coming up from on a tiny shitty little microphone coming up from i think it was maybe clonmel back to hey, dublin that's where i am having <laughs> uh, no, no way I'm, I'm sitting uh, in clonmel <laughs> we i was in, i was in a gaelic speaking um uh, a choir we would do poetry but in in Australia, you know, and I'm not a, I'm, I'm I'm ashamed, and I have my Buntus Kainte somewhere close by. I'm actually I'm actually starting to Cooper study Focal. Gaelic again, getting the Cooper Vocal Australia back. Ex- ex- exactly, exactly. And we had won the Fesh Kill. We'd won this uh, this Fesh Kill, and we were all doing a little sort of party piece. So I've been 
you know, Bowie's been a part of my life for f- close on 45 years, you know? Um, 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 oh, yeah, 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 that, like that long, you know? And, and I remember hearing, um, uh, obviously, obviously Space Oddity, but I think I heard was, was, um, was it, uh, it was, I heard, uh, what's it, uh, I was walking down the high street and I heard footsteps behind me, uh, the laughing gnome, mm. which was the most ridiculous pop song ever that Bowie brought out. I think it was possibly his first single. Ha, 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 he, 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 I'm the laughing gnome and you can't catch me. You know, it's like crazy. He's walking down the street and there's a gnome following up. You know? <laughs> um, had trippy. So we all, yeah, right. We all did this. Uh, we all did this sort of get together and Sting agreed to do it in Los Angeles. We did two nights at the Wiltern Theater. So I got to play um, Lazarus and Black mm, Star oh, class, with, yeah. with, with him. Oh, dude. I can't even tell you. It was Tim Lefebvre was like, on that record originally, wasn't he? Tim, Tim was on the record. Mm. Yeah. There's an amazing thing happening here in LA, man. And I, and I love that it's happening in Ireland too. There's a community amongst bass players. Oh, totally. There's actually yeah. a community. Definitely. We all, we are all connected in social media. Every maybe six months, we get together at the Cat and Fiddle pub in, in Los Angeles, whose family, uh, um, Ava Gardner, who plays with uh, Pink, um, uh, bass player. She, oh yeah, I know, uh, her, I know the one, yeah. Yeah, her family owns this uh, this pub. Um, and she, we're all down there, man. It's a f- That's fabulous. Class. And, and, and Tanya, Tanya O'Callaghan, who's yeah. an Irish girl, Irish I, girl I have well, a, doing great. B- before she moved to LA, I bought her Warwick rig. Oh, you did? Oh, <laughs> I did, yeah. And I blew the actual Tanya- shit out of it. It's fucked now. I- <laughs> 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 Tanya's great. She's a she's a character, and she's actually got a great thing going right now, which is a uh, uh, an organic food podcast. Yeah. Like she a, tra- a travel, travel oh, um, food podcast. Highway to Highway to Health. That's what it's called. There you it? go. Highway yeah, yeah. to Health. It's, exactly. it's, a, it's a bit of a tongue right twister. <laughs> it is. It is. I think her partner said Highway to Hell on about, the first episode. About a thousand it. times, I'd say. There's uh, a lot yeah, of exactly. outtakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but uh, yeah, there's a, there is a great. Uh, there is a great community of bass player uh, of bass players here, but um, yeah, to get to play uh, those songs, actually, I think that w- that was amazing. But the highlight for me was was doing Aladdin Sane with uh, Mike Garson playing piano. I mean, I I have spent. I was on a tour in France, actually, uh, 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 10 years ago, uh, a woman named Milan Farmer. She's like the French Madonna. Um, I did two tour, two tours with her, with Abe Laboreal Jr. playing drums, uh, uh, and she is like you know a godlike character in France, mysterious. She even looks like Bowie, actually, weirdly, like Bowie with the orange hair kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, she she disappears for for five years or six years, and then does one fifteen minute TV interview and sells out, you know, either Bercy in Paris for like sixteen nights. Uh, which is a an are- a sports arena, you know, or we did two nights at the Stade de France, which was crazy, 90,000 people each night. And then we did massive tours of France, all, you know, football stadiums or uh, or arenas, and then into Belgium, Switzerland. Um, the point, the point, yes, I, I, I remember vividly in moments where I just wanted to zone out and be in a whole other headspace, looking out the window of the bus as we were traveling through France and putting on Aladdin saying, you know, a song I've been listening to for 40 years and just tripping in the most beautiful way to the, 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 mad, the, 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 the madness of it all, you know, like this for, 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 you know, for a, a, two minor chords, boom, dum, boom, 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 dum, boom, boom, And Bowie says to an avant-garde piano player, go fucking crazy over this. <laughs> Just go. Yeah. That was awesome like, period in his career. Awesome. <laughs> and then I find myself in the Wiltern, you know, two nights in a row, sitting there looking at fucking Garson playing. And I'm just going, boom, 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 <laughs> boom, 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 you know? That, that and I'm it. telling him, uh, and, and Gaylon Dorsey is singing, you know, and uh, and I'm te- uh, in rehearsal. Mike was like, I can't really remember how we got back into the thing. And I'm like, oh, it goes like this, Mike, you know, oh, that's it. OK, great. Thanks. You know, so weird, 
weird circles closed many times you know yeah, well, that's some was... moment to get to play that on that stage like, yeah. that's it that's oh, it man. if i die now i'll be happy kind of <laughs> oh man oh man i mean i i i made a record with elton um uh, uh, an album called songs from the west coast mm. and uh and I was, I didn't even know that was going to happen until the day it happened. Um, Your entire uh, career is like a, a bunch of like <laughs> serendipitous events. I was just, I was minding well, my own business and some guy asked exactly, me to be on this record. Exactly. Like, exactly. Well, well, yeah, basically. Uh, I got, I, I had got called a month earlier from a producer named Pat Leonard, who used to play with Madonna back in the day. He was like a kid, big keyboard player and writer for Madonna back in the 80s. And Pat's a great guy, beautiful musician. Uh, and he said, look, a month from now, he gave me the date. He said, he, he gave me the specific date. He said, I can't tell you who, I can't tell you where, but I might need you, you know? And I'm like, that sounds very interesting, you know? Um, turns out that what had happened was... And I got this phone call as I'm on the 405 freeway, just heading home. Um, he he um, he had other people in the studio. He had Matt Chamberlain playing drums, who's a wicked drummer from from the, the states. Um, and he ha- I won't mention the bass player's name. He had a bass player from a specific genre, like more like a grungy rock genre, because they were trying. They wanted to try something. You know, they wanted to go for. I guess Elton was looking to freshen it up or something like that. And they wanted to go for something, but it was a fucking disaster. Apparently, it was a disaster of the day. And and I get this call. Oh my god! I say he says like the Queen of England is sitting at the piano and she's pissed. You know, <laughs> like pissed. Um, and I'm like, Wayne, are you saying me and Elton? And he's like, yeah, get be here now. Get here as quickly as you can. And I'm walking. So I'm walking into, it was in Studio A of um, uh, East West. Was, I guess it was Cello at the time. Uh, or it could have been, it could still have been Ocean Way, actually. I think maybe it was still Ocean Way at the time. And I walked through and it's about a 20 yard walk to the grand piano where Elton is sitting. And I'm walking over there and I'm thinking back to having, you know, an, a record player beside my bed, you know, putting on Tumbleweed Connection when I'm a teen, the young teenager listening to this shit and being like, fuck, this is great. This is amazing. Listen to this. You know, he, this guy's so full. He's coming out of England. What the hell is going on here? You know, I don't, I don't even know that I was, I wasn't even intellectualizing it that much. Yeah. I was just feeling this music. I was like, mm. and I'm walking over and I'm like, okay, this is him. Okay. How the fuck is this going to go? And, you know, deep breath shove my hand into his face almost and i'm like <laughs> you know let's do it you know? the, the universal irish ch- hello how are you that'll get you in anywhere Just like you know take take it take a deep breath and and look like you know what you're doing you know and we cut three songs that night we just like not not even that night within about 40 minutes we had three songs cut you know and so he was like i'll see i'll see you to see you tomorrow I'll see you tomorrow you know <laughs> you know, so the, the, the Phil Collins record, I was going to get my hair cut. And I'm literally about to sit down in the chair and my phone rings. And it's one of these little, it's either, a, it's one of the early sort of flip top burners, you know. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's Rob Cavallo. Rob is, uh, uh, Rob produced like Green Day and My Chemical Romance. And he's done, he's got a crazy discography. Amazing producer, amazing producer of like particularly electric guitars, killer electric guitar sounds. Um, like a really a producer who gets in and dials it in, you know. Uh, and I'm sitting about to sit down, and get my haircut, and it's he's like, What are you doing this weekend? And I'm like, I'm getting my haircut. And he's like, Can you be at the airport as quickly as possible? <laughs> I'm like, what? He says, I'm in Switzerland and we've got some sucky like English bass player here, and he's got no balls and he's got no bottom end. And I, I need <laughs> you, come over. <laughs> so I got in the plane, they got me a CD. Like, late, I got a CD delivered. I listened to it on the plane. I went in there. I was home three days later. We cut the entire record in a day and a half. And uh, because all the other tracks were done, it was Phil sitting with me, uh, Alan Sides, who owned Ocean Way and was at engineering, and uh, Doug McKean doing Pro Tools, and Rob. And that was, you know, so all these, uh, all these beautiful circles have closed, you know, from my childhood to like getting to play with people that I adore. That's amazing. Like, but do you ever say no to someone? Like, is yes, there ever, yes, like, yes. I know some professional musicians will, they'll hear an artist and they'll, they'll do a song for free or 
for cheap, you know, because they believe in what they're doing. But do uh, you find it hard to say I, no to people? I will. I have said no. And and I'll tell you why. Um, the first moment I talk to somebody, I get a sense of where they're coming from. Like the first moment we spoke this morning, I'm like, I like this dude. This dude's cool. You know, um, Cheers. when I read, when I read somebody, it's, it's, it's their choice of particularly to do with, can you come and play on something? And the way they start to frame the experience, I know it's going to suck. I totally know it's going to suck. And I say, no, sorry, mm. man, I can't do it. You know, unavailable. I made a decision basically when I, bummed out of college and pissed my parents off like really disappointed my parents who both being musicians said for fuck's sake get a real job you know <laughs> get yourself a degree and get a real job here's me thinking uh, you were lucky to have musician parents they'd be like yeah go for the no, music no, that's I, the way to go oh, no i was i was i was but they also were realists yeah. you know they if if uh if my dad hadn't had a real job uh it would have been a very tough you know life you know because mm. uh it's it's hard to make particularly in a particularly in a small country ireland's a small country you know and it's a beautiful and you know but it's too small there's way not too enough, small it, it, at least in the united states you can start in la and you could spend a year driving around the country and play to a different audience every night you know and to to them you're new like and you're a new experience and they want to pay to see you you know, mm. so um, I did five years in a band here. I was in a band called Edna Swap, a uh, desperate name, which no <laughs> one could remember. Uh, I got, that's kind of a hard one to Google. <laughs> we became um, infamous as the band that wrote the song Torn. That was a massive hit for Natalie and Bruno. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So we, our, our singer and her boyfriend at that time wrote that song. And my stuff and Rusty Anderson, who plays guitar with Paul McCartney now, and uh, Carla Azar, drummer, who uh, used to play with Wendy and Lisa from Prince's band. And she now has her own band called Autolux, which is a very cool art, sort of art rock band. And uh, she also plays with Jack White in Jack White's sort of girl band, uh, one of his girl bands. I think he has two, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, we were in a band and we drove the country for five years. Uh, the first the first few years were miserable because there was a lot of discord inside the band uh, you know personal discord mm. it was an exciting band on stage like a, a Jane's Addiction meets Led Zeppelin kind of band you know like with a girl fronting it mm. in fact you know no doubt and 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 Tom uh, Morello from Rage Against the Machine used to come see our shows and Gwen and I say this with love, but she was definitely influenced by our singer Anne um, uh, with some of her fashion choices uh, uh, in the early part of her her career. Uh, she adored the band and and then brought us on the Tragic Kingdom tour when their first record or their big record blew up the the, the Tragic Kingdom. Um, but the thing, my the point is, you can go around this country for years and people will be excited to see you. It's yeah. probably not the same. It's a very small circle in Ireland. Yeah, I, and I feel do. that. I do 100 gigs a year with the band. And sometimes when you've come to a, the same town for the fourth, fifth time, I, I'd be saying to the lads in the van, if ZZ Top played here every Saturday night, they'd get sick of them. <laughs> like, so don't, don't feel bad that no one turned up on the fifth feel, time we've been here this year. Yeah. Don't feel bad, you know. It's 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 kind of brutal, you know. It's brutal, and and uh, uh, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, th th there was a moment when I when that had to finish, and I was sort of happy that that finished. Uh, uh, and I'm not going. I won't tell this. It's a it's a it's a good story, but it's the big aside, and I'm not going to go into it. But uh, um, uh, it was good to get uh, you on as my first guest because, like, <laughs> you're, you're making my job easy. It's just like flowing out well, of you. It's you like. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can probably, you're going to have to edit about nine tenths of what I say out of this one. I don't know if you read, uh, have you read, have you read Ulysses lately, but the stream of consciousness, just, it's coming out of you there. Like, well, you know, I mean, well, this is more a testament to, uh, to, uh, what I said earlier that I got, I got a good feeling straight away. And I, and that makes you feel, you know, comfortable. And like you could talk to somebody, you know, like you can relax and talk. No, it's great. And, um, do you keep, uh, kind of abreast of what's going on in the bass world like, like who, are, who are the players who are big on the scene or is it just people in LA you're kind of friends with 
I, you know, every now and then, you know, obviously with social media, people are posting stuff all the time and you'll see, you'll see, you know, some guy who is, you know, octopus hands and, and doing this and that and the other. And I'm like, that's fantastic, but I'm not sure that it can be called bass playing, you know? Um, uh, And I don't want to, you know, I also don't want to sound like the old guy who, you know, is, it doesn't want shit to change. You know, I get, I get that from my kids. So (laughs) I I don't want to, uh, 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 I don't want to sound like that guy, but, um, and I, I don't think I'm that guy because I still get to play on records for people who I could be their father, if not their grandfather. So, you know, obviously, (laughs) obviously I'm, I'm still doing something right. But, uh, um, you know, that stuff is just like, okay, that's, that's fantastic. You know, uh, 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 some of them I'm like, you know, and there's a circus leaving town soon and you should probably be in that because that's incredible. And no human being could do that at a certain point. I ask, what's the point, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I think I, it's I, good I, to I, hear you say that though, because it puts people yeah. into a rut when they watch it. Put, I got in a bit of a rut during the, the, the last few months. I put up content myself, like, and it's like, how could, <laughs> is this guy from, I'm not sure where he's from Korea. Maybe Jev is his name. Gev. He's like oh, about right. 10. And this guy is like ripping the bass. Like he's playing better, fa- s- more amazing than I'll ever kid. play. <laughs> I've, I've seen that kid and the bottom line there, and that's where you, that is where you have to make a conscious decision to be like, you know what? That kid kind of has special powers, you know? That's no, that's no ordinary kid. No. That's not even no ordinary adult. That kid <laughs> is, is he probably puts his underwear on outside his pants or something. I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's got special yeah. powers and that, and, and those special powers enable him to be a funky little motherfucker. Mm. He is a badass. That yeah, kid is such he's a an, badass. He's definitely you know? an outlier as they'd call him, you know? He's an outlier. I wonder, you know, there's sometimes, and I'm, uh, you know, sometimes there's an Achilles tendon, you know, ask him, uh, ask him to write something and, mm. and it might be awful, God awful, you know? Yeah. Um, 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 but that's the, there's no point to me even saying that, like, you know, I just, I'm in awe of that kid's playing. He won't be playing on any records that I play on because they don't <laughs> no. need that guy. You know, no. they need some, they need somebody who has a real sense of, particularly in the moment of creation, because some of these songs are being created. All of Elton's songs, we cut 36, 37 songs, all created in the studio in front of my eyes, like all written. That's all class that he still does that, you know? Oh yeah. Ever, he's never changed it. The lyrics were all supplied by Bernie Taupin and Bernie was in the studio for the first day, handing El- Elton maybe 200 stories, you know, and Elton would flick through, see a title, likes the title, reads the song, goes to the piano, writes the song. We witness him writing the song. And while he's doing that, we're learning it. We're learning. That's it. awesome. And then, and then you go in, and you hit it, you know, and you do one or two takes and it's done. And, and, and even I got a lovely compliment actually, uh, over the, over the talk back Elton, I did once, it was actually, I want love. It was a single that came off of that record and it had a, a video with Robert Downey you know, miming the words of the song mm. and moving, moving backwards. I think in the, the film was reversed or something. So Elton got on and said to, uh, said to Davy Johnson and Nigel Olson, who are two of the, two of his original kind of guys said, uh, uh, uh Hey, he reminds me of D, you know, which is like huge compliment. D Murray was like this beautiful melodic, you know, bass player that was in Elton's band at the very beginning. So, you know, you have to be able to in the moment, uh, like I say, bring yourself to that song without, without destroying the song or without, without overplaying, but finding that moment to do that thing, you know, and I, and, and not everybody can do that. Maybe that kid, doesn't know how to do that because no. he just wants to fucking play. You uh, know? Fill, he fills up a lot of space. So he, I don't know. Does he leave the gaps? And to me, bass playing is 90% about the things you don't play. Mm. It's about the silence. It's about the space between notes. It's about letting a note ring just to right to the right point and then letting it go, you know? Yeah. Cause that creates, that creates a visceral feeling for the person who's, listening and and they'll feel that they may not be able to intellectualize it mm. they may not be able to tell you what you did but but whatever you did they it 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 felt it felt something i felt something and it goes back to the role of what is the role of the bass like and that 
to add the well, tension and relief there. That's like, you know. true. That's true. I feel I feel for a lot of bass players now because they all now feel like they need to be um, synth players or they need to play their bass guitars. They need to get all this, you know, sh- shit to make them sound like a synth player. And at times that's good, but... And it's and, and I'm sure it's fun to dive into that technology, all the you know, all this MIDI thing sound, you know. Well, I have been the effects guy for a long time, but I got a, a P bass for free in a charity shop there two years ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I put Seymour Duncan's in it and flat uh-huh. and I uh-huh. never I never really owned a proper P bass and just the sound is just amazing. It's just like I, I couldn't I can't it's put amazing. it down. I'm still playing it. Yeah, it's amazing. And 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 sometimes Sometimes just the base and the simplicity of how you approach something will say everything, you know, it will say everything. I mean, when I talked to you about, as I said, as I talked, you know, nine hours ago about, <laughs> you know, w- <laughs> about, ab- about now is my time to woodshed. Mm. I think that now is my time where I'm going to start to become or try to be a more dexterous sort of a player and mm. bring some, you know, work on technique. I've never worked on technique ever. Yeah. You know? Why not? I, I and 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 I need to grow. I feel like I need to grow as a bass player. I've never uh, f- fully addressed the upright bass. Um, mm. uh, to me, that's a beast in and yeah. of its own. And and there's nothing. I, I hate seeing people kind of fake it, you know, because it's a monster, you know, a, a thing that, a thing that I think a lot of people think now is that you just pick it up and maybe do a little bit of practice and you mm. find a, you know, you can get away with something where it's the same, it's the same with jazz. Yeah. You know, people spend their lives trying to master this craft and, and, and in a way, in a way master also the art of, you know, uh, tone, you know, like 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 to get the most beautiful tone out of an upright, a full bodied upright bass is something that does not happen the first time you play it. No, you have, work on it. You have you got the the book, you know? the Samandel Method? It's like a big. It's like a red. No, no. It's like a hundred year old book. I have it here somewhere. It's like a big red book, and you know Simandel, he's like a German guy. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Invented yeah. the method for bass, so it's ah. just like like a hundred pages of exercises, and they get oh diff, my, more difficult, yeah. and it's the same print. That he made like wow, back. that's uh, that's it, incredible. It's a great book. You should get it if you're really getting into the double bass. It's pretty much the one to get, I think. Well, I have, uh, I have, uh, I have actually, I have an electric upright which I, I, which I just on a whim bought at one point, and I was like, okay, this is going to be easy to practice with. Uh, you know, I can keep it around, and then when I want to get into working on real, really working on tone, once I have a certain degree of technique mm. together, uh, then I can spend time working on tone. I'll get myself a. a a proper but my my dad used to play upright and my grandfather was in the uh, the rt concert orchestra you know back in the day when you went down to i think it was henry street downtown in dublin the the rt had a radio uh station or radio broadcast building down there and you'd go down there at nine o'clock in the morning and there'd be a line of musicians just waiting outside the door for someone to come out and say okay we need two upright basses we need uh four violins two to three violas you know and then like and that was your you know you got that's how you got your job that day you know um and he made a career he had a whole career oh that's yeah awesome. that's uh, amazing I've i have a funny story about my, really it, oh yeah yeah i have a funny story about my double bass it's there it's in the bag i'm not really oh, okay. a double i'm not a double bass pair but i had fancied myself as one back when i was younger and i was going out with a girl i i'm going to tell the story anyway it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, I was going out with this girl anyway, and we were, um, you know, as you do, what were you calling it? You were on it at the time or the switch was turned on. There was a lot of parking going on, <laughs> but the double bass was on its stand in the, in the room, like, and we had an oh, argument. Oh my God. So I came home. Oh shit. Uh, plastered as you would like, and we had an argument. <laughs> so she, she left and wanted to go to her own place. And I, I, I was in my bed, I don't know, probably not much clothes on. And I got up to run down to say, like, don't go. I'm not that drunk. But I ended up just falling over my double bass. It went flying. There's a big hole in the side of it. It's still in the bass. Like, so every time I pick oh it up. Oh, my it, God. So, uh, you, no, have that, you have that there to remind you forever. Yeah. Just stay, if, if you're going to be drinking, make sure your double bass is not anywhere that you can trip over it. Put, put it in the closet. Put it far. Keep it far away. Yeah. Far away. <laughs> but funny, uh, <laughs> uh, have you used much effects? You mentioned sometimes you put it, 
you're not an effects before we came on air you were saying you have some effects i mean i mean every now and then i like to you know in a, in in a recording situation i will you know obviously the song will call for something but um you know uh, i guess i have some standard you know some of the standard effects uh, that, you know that we all probably have on the floor close to us but i like a uh, i like giving um not I like to, I like, because I you see, this is, this is the world we live in now. I do, as I said, I do like 90% of my recording right here and straight into the computer. So I'm using plugins now as, mm. as amps, as amps and speakers and as effects, you know, so I will, I will bring up a guitar, you know, a guitar um, um, amp and speak and speaker to do a distortion rather than using a plugin, mm. you know, and I'll give that track to the, to the person I'm cutting the the song for and be like, here, look, just here's one with a mild distortion. Here's another one with a really heavy distortion. If you want the mild distortion in the verse and use the heavy distortion for the chorus, you know, whatever you, you, you manipulate it yourself. There's because I'm now, and I, I also tour, but this year, you know, my sort of 45 shows, which would have been, you know, it's, it's 75% of my income for the year went down the toilet because, um, uh, because of COVID, you know, mm. and um, um, because with Tim McGraw, I'll be doing arenas all around the country or stadiums, summer festivals. There's these, you know, you'll get 60 to 70,000 people at these summer festivals all all across the country. Amazing times. Uh, I love the guys in the band. We've been we've been touring now for eight years and I've been playing on his records for another six years before that. Uh, that's gone in that show because it's country music and it's a little less, there's no need for, you know, some tremendously exotic uh, sound effects. So I actually have a very small built in sort of a rig where I will, uh, and I'm check this, I'm playing to, you know, between 30 and 65,000 people (laughs) a night, no amp, no speaker. Um, you know, cause we have yeah. a, a completely, a completely flat, uh, you know, no, no, no equipment stage, mm. all the guitar, all the guitars are in cases down below or else they're using, uh, now what the guys are using are, are the Kramer, uh, samplers. So mm. they dial, they totally dial in their sound and you can go straight from the Kramer out to front of house. And it sounds like. You're coming yeah. through a tremendous, a tremendous That's ring. Awesome. It's unbelievable. You don't have one of those back puncher what are they called the bass you know you strap it no, on and no, it's like it's like no, a kick up that, the arse no. like <laughs> I, I i would love that but i actually wear headphones on stage i mm. don't uh i don't do in-ears because uh not only do they never live up to what you really want them to do but i move around a lot i'm actually for for an old fart i <laughs> I'm, I'm all over the stage getting the steps and, in <laughs> and getting the steps in yeah I'll, I'll send you a picture after we're done of me d- doing a only a couple of years ago, doing a flea, you know, like leaping with yeah. the knees up to the chest, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, um, um, I go out to the front of house. I split my signal is split uh, three ways. So I go front of house clean from the instrument. And then I go through um, a sans amp that I've, it's a three setting sans amp. I have it. I have the same one. Yeah. The t- the 21, the tech, yeah. the, or whatever, just whatever it's called. The, um, I I dial it in with a very sim- a very light distortion, a more midland distortion coming off of my pedals, which I can engage with either some sort of a, um, a you know it'd be either a wah or a funky thing just to throw in every now and then some sort of a uh, um, uh, and maybe a maybe a super signature a muff or you know some sort of a, a very signature distortion that just like throws the cat amongst the pigeons for a second you know like mm. something you would not expect or sometimes i have this the mark bass uh um synthesizer simulator sort of pedal that i'll put in i'll use it once in the show but it'll just be like Wah! you know this <laughs> moment of what the fuck and then it's gone you know <laughs> so it's a very simple setup yeah. and then and then I leave it to front of house, you know, to basically, and I'll also on the sans amp, I will make sure there's plenty of bottom real, you know, low bottom on that. So that, um, uh, uh, if he needs to move extra air, it's there, you know, front of house. 
And then it's up to him how he'll feel out the room. You know, he'll dial in the room and feel it out. A lot of those arenas are so hard to uh, sound out, you know, and to make bass sound good. But yeah. the guy the guy we have now and our previous guy were really great at, you know, taking a lot of the direct signal and really focusing that and then just surrounding it with the the fuzz of the distorted signal. Mm. And, it's, and it just sort of... It made for a, you know, a bass player's dream where you actually sound good in an arena. Normally there's so much resonance going on in these uh, arenas, but... Uh, have you played yeah, um, I, Red Rocks? Have you played in that? Have you played in Red Rocks? I have. That's, oh, yeah. I've done, I've done Red Rocks a few times. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's, that's pretty brilliant. open. That's pretty open, that place. <laughs> That's that's wide open. Have you done it yourself? It no, like God, no. It, it just do? looks oh. amazing. Just so I've seen oh. the pic. I know pe- friends of mine have done it and the pictures... It- just it's, looks it's, unbelievable. It's fantastic. Um, uh, I mean, you. Do, I mean, you literally stand on that stage at soundcheck and you look up and you're like, "Okay, this is fucking awesome. This is <laughs> awesome," you know. And then you think, "Oh my god, pride in the name of love." Oh my god, you know, you're like, "This is where it happened," you know. <laughs> and then the next, and then the next question is, and I actually found the guy to ask. I said, "Wait a minute." I said, "I remember Bono looking like he was like ninety feet tall." On, on that video, but the stage is literally that high. That's all the stage is. It's only that high, like in the middle of the stage. It's only that high. And he says, look over there. And I look over right over to the side of the stage, and there's a couple of pillars that are a couple of feet tall. And obviously someone had shot him down <laughs> below. He's shooting up, you know? <laughs> and, that, and so he looked like he was like, you know, a, God. Million, a, million, feet, a million feet tall. The best, well, not the, not the best part. Playing that was amazing going through the tunnel there's a tunnel that will bring you up to uh your soundboard so you literally go under the audience and 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 nobody knows it's there basically unless you go through a kind of a secret door but it's graffiti all the way along the tunnel right way up to the soundboard of all the acts who played there through the years and i can't even believe that i let the let the couple of occasions go by and i didn't write my name on the wall which is (laughs) gotta get got to get the name on the wall it's essential And, and then the third great thing about that place is um that it's a bitch to do a workout in Um, mcgraw is super fitness he 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 really has taken health and fitness and to a like a crazy degree and invited us as a band when we he started this new band he invited us all to come on board if we want to come on board so now we're you know most of us are pretty damn fit like we're Mm. for 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 our age you know i mean i'm i'm cycling you know 12 to 15 miles every couple of days i'm running deep sand on the beach you know yeah i saw i I saw that on social media you're you're putting in a lot of uh, kilometers yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i I love it you know red rocks is a bitch because you go up and down those stairs a bunch of times on an afternoon where it's already 105 you know Ooh, <laughs> you're burnt <laughs> it's a workout but but then you love it you come back in you're 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 just like dripping clean up <laughs> take a little take a little chill for an hour have your dinner get ready bang hit that stage yeah. it's fantastic and the That's audience class. is the the audience is right there. You know, this, the downside of playing most arenas or, and even worse stadiums it is you're so far away from your uh, from your audience. You want to connect, you know, particularly if you're playing. You know, when we do when we do a summer tour, because there's a huge production, there's huge lights, there's huge technology involved. You don't you rarely change up the the set list of a summer tour you rarely change that and even more you rarely change the arrangement of a song so you're playing the same thing every night so you've got to find magic in that every night and most of the magic of that is connecting with these new people that you see every night and literally in the first the first moment you go on stage you're like oh okay i'm gonna i'm gonna lean into these people and see what they you know i'm gonna I'm going to, yeah. you know, get over there and drip <laughs> some awesome. sweat on them and see, yeah, yeah get, drip some sweat on them and see if they, <laughs> if they smile or run away, you know, and if they give you back some love, it's the best thing ever, you know, mm. Red Rocks, they're right there. They're, they're the same height That's as you. They're right there. They're right there in front of you. You know, you play Stade de France and the nearest human being is a little, there's like a thing that size, you know, way down. It's like, yeah. you're, it's, it's great. You're on it's a very strange, isn't it? Stage. Like when they're that oh, far yeah, away, it's, it's hard to it's get crazy. into it, you know, but have you have you any yeah. plans to um, post some kind of base stuff on social media, or do you prefer 
you're 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 not really interested in putting that kind of content up at the moment. I am not interested in putting that kind of content up. I I honestly don't feel that I have anything to anything to teach anybody or mm. show anybody. I think the things that I think if anyone wants to learn about being a bass player, they they should probably just listen to this. That's my contribution, <laughs> you know? I I don't feel that I've got anything mm. to add. I've got, I, 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 can't, um, I can't teach anything about technique, you know, unless you're just completely off the planet wrong in what you're doing. But yeah, yeah. I can't teach you anything about technique. I mean, I, I, I could teach you more about, you know, the soul of it, trying to, trying to just uh, uh, have it be almost as little about, about technique and skin. You know, I, I, I I always recoiled and and almost weirdly, I mean, it sounds terrible, but I almost felt like, oh my God, these poor guys and girls, you know, who go to college because music college became a big thing here in the States, you know, with the Musicians Institute and the Guitar Institute, the bass, you know, all of these things. And they taught you everything except how to actually function as a musician, either in the room with other people or out in the world how to engage how to uh, they would all this technique and nothing really about when to actually use that technique mm. and maybe what i could what i can teach people is uh, a, a, a little bit about discipline a degree of discipline you have to be you know when it comes down to it you're you're not playing in a vacuum you're playing in a song you know particularly as a studio player you're playing in somebody's song this is somebody it's somebody else's vision that they've kind of invited you to become a part of and you have to have the the as the, the tools as a human to to be able to recognize what is necessary in that moment and execute it and that is more about a mindset than technique that's mm. that's a lot more about a mindset than technique you know no, so that's great it, it, in an answer, yeah, I, I I don't know that I would have anything to add. There's 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 some great guys. I love uh, um, what's his name, English fellow um, uh, does the uh, um, oh Jesus, I can't remember his name now. Yeah, they, he he has a load of people on and uh, oh uh, Scott uh, Scott there yeah, you go yeah, there yeah. you go Sc yeah, Scott yeah, Devine yeah yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great player, and I love his. Yeah, great you know, player. And he's got, he's got a, he's got a little tongue in cheek as well, or he's got yeah. a sense of humor about him. I love that. You know, I, used to, I, I, I would feel so like distressed for. I literally would feel distressed when I would meet people and they were just talking about Phrygian and Mixolydian and da da da, and I'm like. <laughs> Dude, it's not it's not science class, man. This is music. <laughs> this is like this is. This is supposed to come from your heart, you know, your heart and soul, you know, that, believe that, it. That's why I wanted to have you on, like, because a lot of the people, the bass players now, they're only looking at the guys who are big on social media and the guys. Yeah. There's, but I'm like trying to say, like, there's these amazing bass players that don't have a presence online, but you got to check them out and hear what they have to yeah. say. Yeah. And, and, and there's, you know, the, the, a lot of people who are online right now are trying to do business, you know, because everything else is kind of dried up a little bit, you know? Mm. And so, yes, their goal is to educate and inform. And I, I admire them for the energy and the effort that they put into it. Um, but I think there's a lot of learning that people can still do. And I would re highly recommend it by, by moving backwards and looking back at all the old shit. You know, I remember someone asking me, you know, uh, 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 what, uh, uh, what's your definition of bad music? You know, and I was like, mm, there's, there's no bad music. Mm. You know, there's only music that maybe I don't like. There's yeah. no only music that maybe I don't identify with or I don't feel. And and that might, you know, maybe there's music that cheeses me out. I don't know. You know, I'm not a great lover of musicals. You know, I'm like, mm. oh, that's that's just hard, even though I'm trying to write one right now. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, and even though, you know, one of my favorite soundtracks of all time is the soundtrack for Jesus Christ Superstar. But oh, yeah, some bass I'm playing not, in that. <laughs> Oh my God, but it's I'm amazing. not a huge fan of musicals mm. in general. But are they a load of bollocks? No, there's there's millions and millions of people out there who love them. Mm. So it's not bad music, it's all relative, you know? You can learn from everything. You know, people ask me, you know, 
who's your favorite bass player and who did you, you know, and when I bring up, you know, um, uh, um, when I bring up like, when I bring up like Sid Vicious or someone like that, you know, or when <laughs> I bring up, when I bring up, you know, people who are not known for necessarily their dexterity. Uh, but I say, you know what, what that person did in that particular band at that particular time was perfect. Mm. If, if somebody else had been playing the bass, somebody more qualified, maybe, or somebody who was more about showing off their own shit, be a different band. Yeah. Might not have totally. this, might not have the same magic. So, so I, I definitely, I definitely have found influence in, in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different places, you know, um, That's I'm, awesome. I'm a great believer in, in that it doesn't have to be perfect by any stretch mm. of the imagination. Don't be afraid to go for something and mess it up. Don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to color outside the lines, you know, because it, it, the, uh, to me, the reason that I got a foot in Nashville 19 years ago, and still am, you know, playing with these people and, you know, doing stuff with other people as well there is because I was not afraid to color outside the lines. I didn't allow a certain mindset to hem me in a little mm. bit. You know? Growth mindset. You have the, you have a growth mind, you know, you're always yeah. willing to grow. You're not stuck in. Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I think you have to be that, you know, um, uh, um, there, are, there are many I mean, I would say to any aspiring bass player now, listen to D. Murray, you know, from Elton John's band back in the day for a phenomenally melodic. Even listen to Ronnie Wood when he played bass, you know, in the mm. in the faces every now and then, you know, <laughs> listen to Ronnie Wood. Yeah. He's, yeah, he play, yeah, he plays like a guitar player, mm. but it's still really cool. When you Keith know? Richards when even he, plays the bass, he comes yeah, up with some cool yeah. lines, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just taking it a little outside of the zone, you know, mm. taking it a little outside of the zone. And that's Ooh. that's always interesting, you know. Yeah, that's what they should be checking out. Not as much the the shredders. Well, check that out, too, if you want. Like, but it, that's Absolute, not your, that, that's I mean, not your meat and potatoes. No. That's like your dessert. <laughs> the, 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 the shredders is still it's still something I'm trying to get my head around. Mm. You know, I, I I even still have. You know, it took me a while to even get a five string bass because not because, you know, as I told you way earlier, it's not because I was a, a Puritan about, you know, vintage instruments or, you know, the, for the bass should be a four string, you know. I mean, what? Pre, the, the, the band, the presidents of the United States, he had two strings yeah. on the bass. That's yeah, all. Yeah, great strings, band too. You know? <laughs> and they're a fucking great band. Great band, you know. So, so, you know, there's, there's no, there's no rules, you know, there's no rules. Cool, sure. Um, and, and there, and there's no need to be, uh, you know, to have your fingers smoking, uh, you know, no. flames coming off your fingers, you know? Yeah. And if Just you're that, if, if you're not that type of bass player, don't feel bad about it. If that's the direction you want to go, take exactly, it, you know? Exactly, exactly, exactly. But uh, if you want to get a gig, <laughs> got to get to the, the meat and potatoes, put in the work, <laughs> listen to the old shit, you know? Listen to the old shit, Ooh. play the, play the old shit, play all, all that, all that eighties pop shit that you say you hate, go and listen to it because there's actually some great musicianship on there. Go and listen to it and just vibe on it. You know, which I'm not, I'm not saying that to you, but I'm just saying that too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, anyway. I've loads of time at the moment. I need to be in the shed. But, <laughs> but I think this is a good point to end it on. And that's, that was great. Like advice there, Paul. And I just I'm really so glad I re you enjoyed it. I really appreciate you coming on. Like it was a brilliant chat. Like for the first episode, I'm it got got it got me started just the way I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I I really enjoyed it, and I really love that uh, it, it was a, a nice organic approach to uh, to talking about bass and 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 life. You know, bass and life because because bass is life. Yes, yeah, that's, that's gotta, what it's all about. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's all about yeah. All right. Base, the final Base. frontier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> don't forget to check me out on uh, at Steve McGrath Base on in Instagram and YouTube. And uh, if you're still on Facebook, not many people are on there as well at Steve McGrath. <laughs> Take care, Steve. All the best, man. Brilliant. 